um, we have these wonderful ladies here today, Annie Cox from the Chime Institute, Dr. Amy Hanready, Cal State Northridge, Department Chair of Special Education, and uh, Dr. Samantha Taves from Cal State Northridge, Assistant Professor. Um, so ladies, I don't know which one was going to go I'm, first. I'm going to start us off. Welcome, Thank everybody. Um, should Are we still letting people in or should I get started? I think right now we don't have anybody in the waiting room, so okay. I think you can go ahead and start. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. As Diana mentioned, our title today of our presentation is Supporting Self-Determination from Preschool Through Adulthood. Um, this work that we are presenting today and this content was put together um, in with support from a grant from the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities that has supported Annie, Amy, and I to really collaborate with many students and adults with disabilities to learn about their um, experience um, pursuing self-determination skills and making making their way through their futures. Um, and it's also supported us to get into schools and support teachers and, and families to provide self-determination support to children. Um, I do want to mention right up front that today we are talking about self-determination skills, so the skills that people use to make changes in their lives, and not about the self-determination program through the regional center. We will talk about the differences between those two things, but I just want to say that up front um, in case anybody is thinking that that's what this presentation is going to be about. There are definitely connections between the two, but it's not, um, it is not what we're focusing on today. All right, let's get going. And it seems that there might be a volume issue. Um, if you could give a Zoom thumbs up if you're hearing us okay. Okay. Um, so I, uh, if you you might need to check your sound if um if you're having struggles um so today we're going to talk about what self determination is the strengths and priorities we're going to talk about ways to promote self determination within family and home routines um then we'll get into self determination and the importance of communication within that skill set um and then we'll we'll finalize or finish off our presentation by talking about person centered planning and the role of self determination in IEP development and implementation um so we're going to talk just briefly about what is self-determination, um, because we're going to get into this across the rest of the presentation. Um, but self-determination is any and all of the actions and skills we use as people to be causal agents or make changes in our lives that are important to us. Um, so that could include skills to self-initiate tasks we want to do, self-regulate to persist in, in working towards things that we want, making decisions and setting goals that impact our lives. We're going to hear from some people right now that it, this is self-determination is not about being independent. It's about understanding the supports that we need and that we access to achieve the things that we want. And so um, today we're going to be talking a lot about how we can support that those skill that skill development in all of our students. Um, and now I'm going to talk just briefly about the difference between self-determination, the concept, and self-determination, the program. Um, and Amy or Annie, if you could stick those. Um, oh, actually, I can do it because I have them linked right here. Um, but self-determination, as I just mentioned, is the skill set that supports us to make desired changes in our lives. Um, Self-determination, the program through the regional center um, is a program offered by the regional center that gives people control over how the funding allotted to them by the state is used for supports that they choose rather than um, receiving the supports the regional center chooses people get control of that funding so they can choose the supports, whether that is, um, you know, 
paying a personal assistant to support them in a, a personal enterprise. Um, it could be it could be anything, right? Um, and in order to support that planning and the use of those funds, um, the self determination program engages in some person centered planning. Um, we don't have time to get into this process much today, but I did just. Put um, one link to a PDF from um, that that describes um, the self determination program, and I'm pasting another link right now um, from Disability Voices United on a website that can provide further information about the self determination program. So. Uh, and I just wanted to add that both of the, I mean, that they are very interconnected, right? So that both of the, both the skills uh, that we're focusing on today are the concept and the self-determination program. You see right there in the middle are focused on the ways to support people to make value decisions that impact their lives. Absolutely. All right. So the next thing that we want to share and part of what we are trying to create through this project is a self-determination toolbox. And I'm sticking that link in the chat right now, but I also have to ap apologize, but also say, you know, you guys are getting this first. Um, we are still working on creating this toolbox. Um, our project is going to create a website. And if you click on this toolbox right now, it's going to take you to a web page, a Google Doc, actually. Um, and you can see up at the top that the we have the web address there for where this content will be. Um, and you can see there are things coming soon. We're going to be recording a variety of, of mini webinars for people and teachers to use to support their implementation of um, self-determination instruction and um, student-led IEPs. Um, but those things aren't quite there yet. What is there right now are many resources related to self-determination, person-centered planning, and other things that we will be talking about today. Um, so I, I, I suggest you click on that link in the chat and just have that open. We're gonna, re we're gonna refer to some of those documents throughout the presentation today. All right. Okay, so as uh, Sammy mentioned that we have had the privilege of talking to people who identify as having disabilities uh, about self-determination and asking for their input and their experiences. And so we just want to give a couple examples of some of the things that they said about what self-determination means to them. Uh, so this is Ryan. Uh, Ryan and I work together on a national committee for TASH, uh, which is a national advocacy organization. Um, Ryan says that self-determination to him means controlling his own life. And he talked about uh, the connection between his access to communication uh, and his ability to engage in self-determination practices uh, and how much his use of uh, full use of a, commu a robust communication system has contributed to his uh, self-determination skills uh, throughout his lifespan. And then he gave the example of one way that he engages in self-determination is problem solving. And he kind of told a story of uh, how he had this problem that he, he, he's a huge sports fan and he went to go see the Lakers. Um, and every time he went with an ex a, a ticket for an accessible seat, they would be sold out even if he was there first. But uh, so he kind of learned and talked to people and uh, talked to people that worked there about what they thought he should do. And he learned that if he just bought a regular ticket um, and showed up in his wheelchair, that they were required to find a spot for him. <laughs> um, and so, um, but that was an example of how he's engaging in problem solving skills and taking action uh, to address those problems just within his day to day life. Uh, this is Grant. Um, Grant and I have also known known one another for quite a while, um, and he's gonna. We're just gonna show a short clip of his experience uh, with self determination. Today we are talking about self determination. I have to say that the definition of self determination that many folks use is not how I think about it. The way I see it. Since childhood, I have been determined to access my life through a process of imitating, more or less, 
the features of neurotypical people as much as possible. It is exhausting to be a humble autistic non-speaking student, bending toward normal at every moment until I collapse at the end of the day. I am now convinced that self-determination is when you finally have the courage to say I am dealing with a set of problems that require help, and I am tired of being shamed toward independence when I am already working harder than my anxiety-ridden heart can bear. So uh, Sammy made the point that self-determination is ju not just about independence. Um, and Grant really, I think, emphasized that in his recognition that self-determination is about knowing the types of help that you need to be successful and then advocating for that help. Okay, and then, uh, and then this is Allison um, who's giving her own definition of self-determination. I would do self-determination as knowing what you want and speaking up or finding a way to get it. And that also includes choices like where you want to live or even what you want to eat, what you want to eat. So Allison also emphasized the kind of um, speaking up to get what you want. Um, but I think that one thing that she also emphasized is, is self-knowledge, self-awareness, knowing what you want um, and knowing how to get it. Um, so that's one of the those early steps as we talk about kind of development through the lifespan is that self-awareness, what knowing your own preferences and knowing what you want is a step before you know how to ask to get it. There's some big it sounded thunder. like thunder. <laughs> is, it, is it thunder or an earthquake? <laughs> I think thunder, thunder and lightning, and it was just so random. It yes. scared me. Oh, I didn't yes. realize my camera was on because my face is like. I know. Sorry, I I definitely got distracted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, We're not so used to that. <laughs> So why is this important? Um, I know that at the start of this grant project, um, Annie actually had been to a presentation that was really talking about uh, outcomes, poor outcomes for people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, um, and it was upsetting. Um, and, um, and I think that our biggest goal was to determine what can we do? What, you know, what small piece can we contribute uh, to address some of the factors related to those poor outcomes. Um, and we know that, so then we landed on self-determination because we know that self-determination skills support it, growth of autonomy um, and improve overall quality of life, both right away, as to, you know, in any time we engage in self-determination skills, then we're improving our own quality of life. Um, people become more self-determined as they identify their own interests and preferences through setting and working towards goals, uh, engaging in problem solving and decision making, and advocating for themselves. Um, we will be going uh, more into detail about those different components or elements of self-determination. Um, Self-determination is not just for people with disabilities, it's for all of us. Um, all of us uh, can probably benefit from continuing to build our own self-determination skills, our own self-awareness, um, building our own strategies for decision-making and problem-solving. So this isn't unique to people with disabilities, but we also know that people with especially uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities are disproportionately educated in settings where they are less likely to be taught or engage in these types of activities. Um, and so we might need to ensure that they are explicitly taught uh, both at home and at school um, because they need to learn and practice those skills, we all do. And then finally, I emphasize those poor outcomes. Um, and so uh, some of the main issues related to those poor outcomes are low employment and minimal control over both small and large decisions that impact their lives. Um, our goal is that we don't wait until individuals are leaving school systems to address those challenges that we begin now. 
uh, whether they're uh, infants, toddlers, preschoolers, or, or however old they are, we believe that now is the time to emphasize this uh, focus on self-determination. And um, that is just exactly what this slide is here to say as well. Um, and I just want to build off of what Amy just said and, and say that um, you can see this kind of swirly, spiraling um, image. And this is to show that self-determination skills are complex and difficult. And starting to teach about setting your own goals and working towards them explicitly in middle or high school gives us a lot less time to practice and go back and, and try things. Um, we talked to a lot of teachers during this last year about um, implementing self-determination instruction in the, in the classroom, um, particularly with for students with more extensive support needs. And a lot of them said, I'm trying all these strategies, but I don't think it's making sense to my students. And that's okay. It's a lot of things that we teach for the first time to anybody doesn't make sense the first time. And so the more we start out with really young children doing some age appropriate goal setting, what do you want to do next? Um, which of these things is most interesting to you? How will we get them? What do you think we can do? The more that we can start that really early, and if it doesn't make sense, that's okay. We're going through the process of giving opportunities, teaching explicitly, modeling how we make decisions, um, talking about how our kids and our students can make decisions, all in, in infant toddler, in preschool, in TK, in thir third, fourth, fifth grade. By the time we get to middle school, we've had so much practice. It's not the first time we're talking about it. Um, so this is just here to say we, we have to start early. We have to start at home explicitly teaching these skills, and we need to focus on them in school. There is a, a great article that was written a few years ago and published by the Division of Early Childhood under the Council for Exceptional Children um, addressing self-determination for young children that starts out by saying, Iman imagine that when you woke up in the morning, someone had rearranged the furniture in your home, uh, scheduled all your activities, and continued to make every decision for you throughout the day. Um, how would you feel? If every decision, decision such as what to wear, what to eat, uh, and where to go was made for you. So those are the kinds of things imagining, you know, especially for young children, uh, what that might feel like and how we can support them uh, to this processes. Um, we know as adults uh, that we need practice. Um, Amy had um, and Sammy have um, talked about that a little bit um, and support to make informed choices about initially simple and then more complex uh, problems uh, throughout our lives and or in certain moments of our lives, right? Um, therefore, young children uh, with disabilities also need practice um, and, ongoing to, uh, and ongoing support to maximize those opportunities uh, for learning the self-determination uh, continuum. Um, in working with partnership with families, um, we found that it helpful to identify the elements of self-determination. So they're listed here and we'll be sharing a document with you. There's um, you know, certainly uh, some overlapping concepts, uh, but we thought let's, you know, in terms of definition, what do they mean uh, so that we could be clear about you know, how to best support um, children. Um, and, and also to establish family goals. It, this partnership with families um, has been really important. You know, what's important to families um, as well as where children are, or um, I say children, uh, we usually <laughs> refer to children, but all ages, right? Children, young adults, um, in terms of their current skills um, and strengths um, and desires, um, it, you know, choosing, making choices and moving on. Um, as with all other developmental areas, we also want to create every opportunity for independence. Um, and also at the same time realizing, so you see that um, on the right of the slide, the support throughout life, 
here's another quote that I, I really like. Uh, Self-determination is essentially about making choices and decisions about one's own life without any more support than necessary. And I think that that's, you know, so just the right support to encourage independence, but also to support um, where children are, where people are in their own uh, skill set and is still developing. Uh, so regardless of age or stage, uh, we want to continue to gauge what is um, that support needed um, and help people decide what help might be needed at that point. The next slide. Uh, so this project made us think a lot about um, working together with families, like I said, um, and how we could address strategies and create opportunities for children to begin to, de the, to develop these long, uh, lifelong self-determination skills. Um, so it's really looking uh, for, to the future, right? So working with um, families of young children is thinking about where are we going? What, the, what is this road? <laughs> where, are we, where is it taking us? Um, and starting with meeting child needs and pre preferences at a young age. Um, so if we look, this is, um, uh, I, I thought a really nice uh, way to look at the different areas and maybe some strategies for creating self-determination opportunities. So for example, in considering play spaces at home, can the child reach or indicate a choice uh, within that setting? Uh, is there a variety of play things so that we can determine what, sound, what looks or sounds interesting to that child? So looking for, for preferences um, very, at a very young age. Can children put away toys by him or her by themselves? Um, are there opportunities and activities that promote play with friends? Again, from a very um, young age. In terms of the choice and decision making, some questions again to ask ourselves is how is the child accessing different areas of the house? Um, is can the child move with some independence? Um, are closets and drawers accessible? You know, if we think of young children, that kitchen cabinet or drawers where kids are taking things. Uh, in and putting them back, uh, you know, taking things out and putting them back in. Are we making those things accessible for all kids? Um, and is adaptive or assistive equipment available at home as well? Um, and are they choi our choices built throughout the routines? Um, under control and regulation um, in the home, um, we think about our children being encouraged or supported to express a variety of emotions. So, you know, not just those emotions that we sometimes think about as positive, but all emotions and thinking about also recognizing how they might be showing us those emotions even before they have a, a strong communication system in place. Um, is the child supported to participate in activities that she might not be able to participate independently um, yet? Um, what about access to a quiet place? Or what about um, the ability to regulate the environment a little bit? Sound, you know, if the music is too loud or the lighting is too strong, all those kinds of things that we can think about, you know, and offer to uh, children starting very early. Um, and then the support of um, self-esteem, um, just even things about children looking themselves in the mirror, having pictures at the child's eye level, you know, pictures of families, of friends, um, what about uh, artwork or treasures that children may find um, displayed in the home so that they can see and then feel valued as well? Um, and by doing all these things, we're creating a pathway uh, for increased independence, uh, for um, self-regulation and self-advocacy. So lots of different things. And I think the next step um, talks a little bit more about it. Um, let's see. So. This is a form as we, um, again, by working alongside families that, you know, the expertise from families is just so important when we are supporting children at school, um, is that we can find out a lot about where children are um, in what to, we refer, and I'm talking about then preschool children as an emerging self-determination skills. 
uh, in our preschool program before we started our school year. Uh, we asked families a number of questions, um, including how does the child indicate choices and preference? How does the child engage in self-regulation? Um, all the different things, some of the answers are here. And it was super helpful for us to be ready for that first day of school, knowing you know that that child struggles with self-regulation uh, when overstimulated. So we could just like, you know, when does she get overstimulated? Is it loud sounds? Is it a crowd? And then, but also what the kind of things that are helpful for that child, uh, holding her drinking cup, being removed, being hugged, uh, lots of hugs, <laughs> that deep pressure sometimes. So here's a form um, that we have created. Um, again, to support families through, and I, I'm going to say educators um, through that process um, as we learn more and partner with families. Uh, so looking at um, current, you know, current skills and strengths, and then in deciding, <laughs> sorry, dogs, um, and then deciding um, the, the goals and areas for growth. Sorry about that. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Okay. Um, so really thinking conceptually about self-determination, we talked about those different elements. Um, these are some different areas that we focused on as ways in which we're considering um, how we're incorporating self-determination into an individual person's or child's life. Uh, right. So one of those in the, that giant bubble there <laughs> is really focused on the skills, right? So all of those different uh, elements that Annie was describing and that are on that sheet, uh, those are skills that we want where we want to embed practice throughout the person's day, right? So this isn't something that we're going to be able to work on, you know, 20 minutes twice a week in a special therapy room. This is something that is going to be addressed every day, all day long by really strategically considering what are some ways that we can embed those skills. And we will be giving some examples. We have a couple of video examples too. Um, but there's some other pieces to that puzzle too. And so we wanted to make sure we just touch briefly on those other pieces. So one is that collaboration piece. And I think Annie gave a great example of that type, that collaboration between home and school, because this really needs to be embedded throughout the day. We need really clear communication about the types of skills we really want to focus on, what our priorities are right now related to self-determination, and then have similar types of things that, this, that maybe the child or the young adult is being expected to practice between home and school. So we're really supporting that consistent practice. Um, you saw that we started off with some input from the disability community. You'll see that at several points throughout this presentation. Uh, the more that we talk to people with disabilities, the more they talked about how uh, crucial access to adults with disabilities has been for them in developing their own self-determination. Um, so knowing other people uh, and, and seeing models and examples of how they engage in the world whether as young people or as adults, is has been critical for those that we talk to in helping them to have a sense or an idea of what this could look like for themselves, right? And we know that everybody's different and that there's huge diversity within the disability community. Um, and therefore we need lots of examples and lots of models. Um, so really starting to make sure that we're connected with the disability community as a family member. Um, there's lots of great ways to do that. I always point to TASH as a great um, organization and we have CalTASH, which is a state, our statewide chapter that includes families, individuals with disabilities and professionals and at all levels of the organization. Um, robust communication support is there. Uh, you saw that Ryan uh, really uh, identified that communication support as critical, as did Grant. Um, and we really feel like that support for robust communication access has to go hand in hand uh, with the development of those self-determination skills. We really can't do one without the other. Um, student participation in the IEP process, right? So if we want students to engage in more leadership and ownership of their own lives and their own programs, well, for students with disabilities, the IEP is a critical piece to that. Um, and so really increasing the ways in which students participate and have involvement in their educational programs is, is a, a big part of this puzzle. And we'll talk about some strategies for that. Also, 
Um, and then just recognizing that this is an ongoing learning process, uh, right? And, and we're all learning together, um, but then just continuing to build our own knowledge and our own skills about this area, especially as we've, we're have seeing pretty recent kind of explosion of new ideas and new resources. Uh, we can't get stuck uh, with just kind of a limited understanding, but continuing to build that. And this slide is just here to reinforce the learning cycle for self-determination skills and highlight that we need to provide explicit teaching. Um, so there is kind of a, in our reading about self-determination and skill development, there's this idea that sometimes we don't explicitly teach these skills because we assume that students learn them throughout their lives naturally from observing other people making choices um, by having opportunities of their own. But what we know about supporting the, the growth of these skills is that we need to provide explicit instruction and modeling and support before we just provide opportunities and expect students to engage in these skills. This is true about everything. I have this conversation with my teacher candidate students all the time. We need to make sure we teach the, the thing and show students examples of it before we are saying, okay, now you do it. And um, I expect you to be able to do it. Um, so this is just a reminder that we need to go through this cycle continuously and come back to that teaching frequently. Once again, um, referring to early childhood, but throughout life, uh, self-determination can take many forms. Um, having a sense of autonomy as an individual and being able to exert some control over the environment. Um, for families, our advice is to consider your values in thinking about the future and creating opportunities uh, for this lifelong determination skills. So when we think about all these uh, shapes and pillars. <laughs> um, so designing a supportive environments that, provo uh, that promote active child involvement, uh, providing encouragement to self-regulate, so the self-calming, soothing activities, uh, working out simple disagreements. You know, sometimes we forget to model and teach that uh, for young children um, and, and allowing those productive struggles, right? Um, allowing um, that, that wait time, allowing um, children to uh, persevere and, and coming up with a solution on their own. All those skills and um, the message I think that families give to their children is very important. You know, it's like, you can do it. Like, the, I, I, I believe in you, you can work through this. We can, uh, but, you know, let me know if you need help, but also modeling the things that are important for you. Um, uh, allowing uh, for the child to persevere, like I said, um, and then the modeling and teaching, like Sammy uh, talked about, um, that we start very early in terms of following the child's lead, you know, at the very beginning, uh, establishing those uh, preferences, and that becomes really important then when we are providing choices, right, and, and talking about uh, at you know basic level about I know a child likes this so let me see you know and I know a child doesn't like this let me teach that skill of making a choice and following through this one I think it's a slide Amy I just yeah I just wanted to give a shout out to making and sharing plans <laughs> um, because I think that uh, you know I think I not to hit it too hard, but I think that for people with disabilities, they're often at more risk of not of having plans made for them that are often not shared with them, right? And I, I certainly was guilty with my own daughter of, you know, grabbing her hand, putting her in the car, um, driving somewhere, and all of a sudden, and because she had the ability to communicate, which she'd say, where are we? What are we doing? <laughs> and I would say, oh, you know, I, I I forgot to tell you what we're doing. Um, I was busy, you know, thinking about the next thing. And I think that, um, you know, this isn't a common experience for people with disabilities is not always being explicitly told 
what we're doing, where we're going, even the plan within an activity, kind of saying, okay, you know, I'm going to, we just got home. I'm going to uh, wash my hands. I'm going to start making dinner. I'm going to turn on the TV for you, you know, but kind of saying those things out loud is a model for how we, how we think through the, and make plans for ourselves and for others. And so that's part of that process of making sure that people are, you know, really part of this uh, planning and problem solving from the very beginning, even if in the beginning, it's as a listener or as a recipient of that information, as we, as we grow and develop, we want to provide ways for them to participate in making the plan. Um, I just wanted to add, thank you, Amy, for saying that. Also, you know, sometimes it's um, for uh, parents, it's you, you're rushing, right? You have, there are uh, times to get to places and things like that. But even that in terms of choosing, you know, at a time of the day where those things can be slowed down a little bit so that, um, you know, children get to practice that. Um, so this is a, a video really to illustrate, uh, this is, um, in preschool, um, about choice making, about being around peers, uh, so choices of activity, materials, and actions, um, and it's playing in the sandbox. <laughs> And it's hard to hear, but she's asking, where do you want to put it? Where do you want to put that sand that they just scooped? So she created a choice, right? There didn't have to be a choice there. The, that uh, that assistant created a choice um, and then was very patiently waiting for an indication from the child uh, in response to that choice. I don't know if you want to add anything, Annie, sorry. Yeah, no, I think it's just, you know, that like all super important, you know, in terms of uh, for the appear to see that, to expect that, you know, those expectations, I think setting expectations that, you know, you know, we know the child could do that, could make that choice. And so I think that that intention uh, is really important as well. Okay. Um, and then just um, thinking about other ways in which students can actively engage in systems where we're creating opportunities, right? So that last example, there was a, an opportunity created to make a choice within an existing routine. Similarly, this is an opportunity for a student to engage in uh, a little bit of like leadership and control in his middle school classroom, um, where, you know, unfortunately, sometimes in middle school, there tends to be a lot of just teacher led uh, stuff, right? It's all it's all teacher directed and a lot of expectation for students to sit and listen. So this is a kid that really needed some control in his life. Um, he was seeking that. And so the team uh, created this opportunity for him. So he's just taking role. It's part of a regular routine. And not a big deal in his, in his classroom. So, no one. So, not a big deal, right? He's just uh, he's used to that routine. He has pick. He goes through the pictures and reads the names and waits for a response. Um, but he's in charge. Of that of that portion of the day and that's a really important uh, experience for all students to have is having that opportunity to be in charge and be a leader no. oops um so just you know we talked about some different activities and i just wanted to add some examples of those uh support strategies the little things that we do uh, that so within everything um, that supports self-determination. And so uh, you saw already a couple examples of wait time, 
um, right? Giving time and an expectation that students will respond or initiate in some way. Um, and those responses might be subtle, um, but we're looking and waiting for those responses because that allows us to follow their lead rather than us leading uh, within an interaction. Um, there's also a little post it there that says less intrusive prompts. And that's a very kind of educator ease <laughs> way of saying uh, kind of what Annie said earlier is that we're providing only the support that's needed. And I'm just going to give a couple really quick examples. We have some quick video examples of what that looks like. Uh, they were created by a colleague of ours, Elia Mahoney. Um, and um, the big focus is on giving children the opportunity to notice what we call a natural cue or just something within the environment that tells us that something needs to happen, right? Like the bucket and the shovel are there. That's a cue that we're going to use those and, and play with sand, right? So she's using the example of uh, painting with her son. Um, and so the natural cue here is that she's just going to put out the painting materials. Here's your stuff. Okay, so a lot of kids, if they see those materials out, see that as a cue that they can play with them, right? That's a natural cue. Um, now, we know that there's a lot of kids who don't get uh, always notice those natural cues and might need some additional support. Um, the problem is sometimes as educators or as family members, we sometimes jump in really quickly and provide more support than, um, than what a child might actually need in the moment. Um, sometimes because we just want to get it done or, or we're kind of looking, thinking ahead to, uh, to future steps in an activity. Um, so we really want to just emphasize on a couple less intrusive prompts or strategies. So one of those is a gesture prompt. So before we say anything um, or, or jump in with physical support, uh, we want to provide some extra cues for them. So a gesture, well, you'll see. <laughs> So tapping, pointing, or nodding, just some way of indicating uh, whatever it is that you're asking the child to do at their level. Um, so we always wanna think, so we're gonna give wait time first. We're gonna think about, are, is there a gesture? Can I just point? Can I try to bite my tongue for an, another <laughs> second before I uh, provide some extra help? Um, we can add visuals in. Now, in this example, she has a visual, that, which is a picture. Here's your so a picture can be an extra cue um, for something. And I always say that we want to invest our time creating pictures for things that happen only very regularly, right? So it's only worth our time to create pictures, especially in the home environment and create those tools for stuff that's gonna be part of our regular routine. We really wanna emphasize um, more autonomy for, for a child within that routine. Um, then, um, so we can also provide indirect verbal prompts that draw child, children's attention to what it is that they need to do without directly telling them. So it's allowing them to take a little bit of a mental leap to take the next step. What should we do with the brush? Right. So he gets to make a little bit of a, a leap uh, for what the task is that he needs to do. So that's still expecting more of him than simply telling him what to do. So the next would be a verbal prompt where we actually tell him. A, verb, a direct prompt is just saying, what should you be doing? Put the brush in the water. Okay, and I'm going to stop there. Um, 
I, I just wanted to emphasize that I think a lot of us, including myself, tend to jump in with those direct prompts and telling um, kind of as our first <laughs> our first step um, in a lot of activities, especially as the things that are part of our daily routine where maybe children are used to relying on that level of direction. And so this is kind of a challenge to think about uh, one time or one aspect of a routine where we could work on scaling back that level of support just to the level that the child's able to uh, accomplish. Yeah, go ahead, Sammy. And I just wanna add what's not there is the modeling and teaching. And so if you have a student or your child who's struggling with an activity and needing lots of prompting, that's also a great indication that we might need to go back to the teaching and modeling. Like, hey, let's do it together. Look, I'm taking the brush, you take the brush. We're gonna do every step together and then I'll fade back my support and my prompting. But we might need to go back to the teaching. So then just one more th on this page that I wanted to point out is talking with and not about. Um, so I think that one thing we really work on in our edu educator preparation program is uh, not taking away the uh, autonomy of children by talking about them in front of them. Um, we know that uh, especially for kids who don't yet have a full communication system, that uh, it's really easy to um, you're you know you're picking up your child from school or from therapy you're holding their hand getting ready to go and you need to have a conversation with the educator or the therapist and um, and so you end up talking about <laughs> how they're doing or what they did during the day uh, unfortunately talking about them as if they're not there or as if they're not part of the conversation could really serve to kind of alienate them from that conversation. Um, and all it takes sometimes is a little bit of a flip of the language to include them as part of the conversation. Hey, you know, hey, Nikki, how'd you do today? And then I kind of look at the teacher too. Oh yeah, I know we've been talking about that. You've been having a hard time with that. We'll keep talking about it on the way home, okay? Like, so just keeping them in the loop as part of the conversation rather than allowing a conversation to happen about them um, when they're not uh, included in it. Uh, and then I'm just going to show a couple examples, I think, of checklists, or maybe Sammy's going to talk about the checklist. Oh, Before oh. we talk about checklists, um, Amy also talked about this, but I want to just highlight the importance of wait time. Um, so we're going to watch a really brief video. So in this example, this, this adult is providing some gestures and wait time. They're not jumping in, they're not touching the computer mouse, they're giving the student time to explore and struggle with this activity of accessing whatever the assignment is on this computer. Um, and I, I want to highlight that particularly for things that happen on a regular basis, like accessing documents on a computer, signing into a computer, getting materials out, these are the times to slow down, make supports, and provide multiple opportunities per day to teach these, to teach independence or interdependence, asking for the, the supports necessary to complete these skills. Um, I was talking with Amy and Annie the other day about a high school that I was supporting um, that I visited and they were asking, you know, what are ways we can support the student to have more of an active participation role in the school day? And I went to three different class periods and in every class period, students got out their Chromebooks signed into a Google Classroom and opened some sort of warm up. And in every single period, the paraprofessional got the student's computer out, opened it up, logged into their Google Classroom, and then said, okay, here's the warm up, which had been adapted to be accessible and then all of these different things. But in none of those three opportunities was the student asked to, to participate in that consistent routine activity. Um, and that's just a, a prime opportunity to provide support and modeling for period one. And then in period two, maybe we do two steps together and the last step is independent. Um, but um, it's really important to provide space for, for students to, to take time with that. And if that cuts a little bit into the warm up time in certain classes, 
that might not be the most important learning time for that student, right? There Usually there's going to be a review of that material. Then we're going to get into the lesson. It's important to identify those times we can slow down and teach and provide opportunities and give students space to struggle and ask for support. Um, the next slide is um, an example of a lot of different checklists. So checklists are an amazing tool to create to support um, students to, to engage act in, uh, more independently in multi-step tasks. Um, these examples here are um, ones that Amy's daughter had created for herself to support her. And Amy, I'll let you say what those are um, and then I'll go on. I mean, my, yeah, I think that my daughter was very disorganized as a child. And so we just started making lists and now she really has taken it and run with it um, to maybe a, a little bit of an excess. But um, so you can see like, these are her school assignments. Um, she, you know, has things that she wants to order before school starts. She had things that she wanted to accomplish during the summer, uh, in 2019, things that she wanted us to send to her in her camp care package. Um, but a lot of like thinking ahead and planning is going into all of these different lists. And then I put our family's grocery, really messy grocery list on there too, just as another example. And so providing these examples to students and showing like, hey, I use a checklist as a teacher. Look, I'm going to do this. Great. I did it. Um, now I'm going to do my lesson. OK, I did my lesson. Now I'm moving on. But then supporting you can go to the next slide, supporting students to then use those checklists. Um, so here's an example of a student using a checklist. There you go. There you go. The camera. Oh yeah. All right. He was right. distracted Ready? by the camera. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are we okay. Yes. She's saying, are we in math class? The student said yes. And he knows now, okay, I'm there. I get to check that off. Check the boo. Are you in You're Google right? Classroom? Yes. Oh, great. I did it. Yep. And then awesome. I'm not sure what airplane is, but now it's time for airplanes. <laughs> It was part of a math activity where they were flying paper airplanes and like measuring how far they went or something. I don't know. Great. Yeah. So this is just an example of giving a student opportunities multiple times per day that they can say, oh, I did that. Great. I've done it. I'm checking it off. I'm monitoring my own progress through the day. Um, and these are the opportunities that can then grow to planning goals that take longer than just this day. Um, checklists or task analyses are also excellent for providing more opportunities for students to work independently and track their own progress. Um, so here's an example of giving a student a checklist of things that need to be done before turning in an assignment. We're gonna cut, we're gonna glue, we're gonna write two sentences, then we turn it in. Um, so you can think about how to adapt checklists like these to your home or um, activities you typically go to outside of your home or if you're teaching in your classroom. And check out those embedded literacy skills as well, right? Um, so now I want to talk about the importance of integrating self-determination skill instruction into your whole group class instruction. So if you're if your child is at school, this might this might mean talking to the teacher about like, hey, what do you do in your class to support students to plan and track their progress on their own goals? Um, so we're going to show a couple of videos. Part of our project was supporting teachers to integrate whole group goal driven instruction where students were identifying goals that were meaningful for them related to school, working towards those goals, identifying barriers, coming up with small steps they could take and then checking in with each other. And so these are just a couple of examples of how when we do um, goal instruction for all students, it gives us opportunities to facilitate conversation between students, between students and teachers um, about goals and, and these self-determination skills as more of a 
a, a normal thing that everybody is working on and everybody needs. And it, it becomes less of a, a special event that we are talking about goals. It's just part of our lives. It's a thing that we all do. So we'll watch a couple examples. Let's do Amy, I wonder if you're sharing for sound because we can't actually hear very well. Yeah, it said share for sound. Oh, okay, I can't hear it. I don't hear anything, but there's subtitles. Do you want to actually, Amy, because we're going to have several videos right now, maybe we could like stop the share and then try reshare. Or I could try sharing since yeah, maybe. Why don't you try sharing? Because I'm not sure it might be my issue. Sure. Oh, the host disabled sharing. Oh, I gave host to Diana. Diana, do you want to make me the host again? Yes. Um, let's see. Where are you? There you go. I'm here. Okay, go for it. Great. Thank you. Share sound, optimize for video. Here we go. Okay, this is Finn talking to his peer in class about his goal um, or, and his, his goal that he's working towards in this whole group instruction. Let me slideshow. Jack is asking you a question. Can you hit captions? Um, I, I decided to, I, I picked out, well, these options, something else. Well, why don't you do Your choices are, look at the teacher. Yeah, can you read those, uh, Jack? Oh, use your computer. Could you ask to help with the yeah, who can you ask for help? Let's find school people on here. Who can you ask for help? Yes, I would be happy to help you. Is there anyone else that you could ask for help with your goal? You didn't need to ask anyone. Okay. But Finn, let's say you did. Yeah, exactly. You would go to school people. You could ask for some more fee, yeah. Who else could you ask for help at school with your goal? Miss Woodward. Yeah. I would be happy to help you. So we saw in this interaction that these students are having a conversation and Jack, the peer, is modeling talking about who he asked. He he said he didn't ask anybody, but you know, this this process of, of targeting goal work for everybody and everybody making the plan provides the space to have these conversations. Um, and you also saw examples here of, of wait time um, and trying to provide less support. Um, so that's just one example of a discussion. We're going to watch um, one. I wanted to remind you. Um, we're going to see um, Emmy talking to her peer about her goal here. Um, similar process in this school, they were working on identifying goals as a class. And this is just another day that they're talking about their progress towards their goals. What have you done to work towards your goal in the last week? Nothing. 
So you're going to turn to your partner right now and go ahead and share with each other what you've done to work towards your goal. Um, progress. Um, so I believe my goal was to finish my create this book. Okay. And Ems, what was your goal? Emerson's goal. Do you want to read it out loud? Yeah, why don't you read it out loud? Um, Emmy's goal was to work on expressing emotion and thoughts. I know you've done this. Just <laughs> telling you. Me to be in the middle. So here we have a student who is expressing their responses to these questions. You might not have um, noticed this by just the um, video, but this student is using eye gaze to indicate, um, yes, I'm looking in the center. Um, no, I'm looking to the left or the right or, or um as something else um, on another direction. And so here's an example of really supporting that communication, um, regardless of what communication system the student is using, providing those opportunities to give input on their goal, to hear from a peer, um, to, to give their opinion on what they wanna do next. Um, what you didn't see here is that um, every question has a something else option. Um, so rather than just saying like, yes, no, or which of these options do you want? There's always a something else. And that's important because we don't wanna convey to folks who are using static communication systems that these are your only options. We've chosen these things. These are the things you can say. We want there always to be an option for like the thing I want's not here, um, because that in itself is a really important part of self determination. Is saying like, no, these aren't the things I want. Something else. What have you done? Um, and here's an example. Just um, I'm gonna let us watch it, and then I'll I'll tell you what this is an example of. This is a beer talking to one of his teachers about um, how he works towards his goals. Have you ever been frustrated when working towards your goal? Yes, I have been frustrated towards my goal, but I split it up to make it e to make it much easier. Like that, you can do one thing at a time. That's that's so smart, right? You have this big goal to go to I work college. On, I work on one thing at a time while well, for each day of well, two weeks. Nice. So I have you a goal for every day? That's a little piece of your big goal. Yep. In order to manage uh, the goal of frustration, I managed to work out and to do my meditation and to listen to music to motivate me. Oh, nice. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. I think meditation is something. Because I do it on the weekends as well. Okay. That's why I have time to do it. So you just put your headphones in and yeah, listen and, to music? Yeah, and, and I close my eyes as well and do it. And that helps, that, how does that help you feel? Help, I, mean, I mean, feel refreshed and kind of motivated to do it. So. Awesome. So this is an example of a student really explicitly discussing how he manages working towards his goals by splitting them up, by um, using self-regulation strategies when things are hard, listening to music, taking a break, doing some meditation, recentering, getting motivated. Um, these are all things that people might discover naturally, but when we provide um, explicit instruction around self-determination skills and we give students the words around breaking up their goals and self-regulation and um, having giving them the opportunity to explore that over time, then we, we end with folks who, who do use those skills and can tell people about that and navigate um, navigate requesting supports and, and understanding when I need support and when I don't want support. Um, so this is just an example of, um, of, of why, why it is important. We, we want our students and our children to be able to voice how they break things down and, and know to do that. Oops. Have you ever been All right. Okay, so this is another student who's going to be talking about a, a goal that she has, and I think it's I think it's clear. But I, what I want you to really note uh, during this interaction is also how her her mom is interacting with and supporting her through the interaction. 
it's my first time there. I was in ninth grade. When you started? When you started. 10th and then 11th and then 12th. Sometimes I get nervous. Yeah. It's really hard. But you like to da the dance moves and you wanted to try? Yeah. I wanted so did, to try to fly. You wanted to be a flyer? Yeah. No, I can't do it. It's okay. You can still practice. I did a teddy bear stunt. Oh, that's good. Yeah, teddy bear stunt is fun. And it can be a flyer. Okay. Me. It's okay if, because you need a lot more practice to be a flyer because they throw you up in the air and you know how you need to know how to land. So you have a lot of practice time, lots, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of your goals to do to to do it mm -hmm. one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some things you need to practice to do that? Matias. Yeah, and your. And what else? The dance. The dances, and then what else? I think that's it. Mm -hmm. And then more. And the uh, tumbling, tumbles, tumbling, mm -hmm. right? You have to practice tumbling, right? Mm -hmm. And stretching, mm -hmm. because you have to stretch your legs up in the air, right? Really yeah. high. Really high. Mm -hmm. How, how many times during the week do we practice that? Two, I think. Two? Yeah. And are there any people that help you with that goal? Um, there's Steven. The co coach, Steven, coach helps Steven you? Helps me. Mm -hmm. Any other girls help you? Bri Brielle? Go oh, down. Yeah. And who else? Angelina. And Angelina helps you, yeah. I'm wondering, and it sounded like maybe this is a goal, this is something that's sometimes frustrating for you. Is that is that right? That it's taking a long time and it's and it's frustrating? Sometimes. Is there something that you can do to help yourself stay focused on that goal and not give up? Um, come down. Get my stress ball. Would you have a stress ball? Yeah. Do you um, do anything like to help yourself stay focused on it? I know how pictures of a poster. I like YouTube. And they show you, so you look at cheer stuff on it? I'll say Netflix. Netflix? They have some cheer movies there? Mm -hmm. So, um, so Bella wanted to be a flyer, which is the person in cheerleading that they throw up in the air. Um, and it's like, I feel like everybody wants to be the flyer, right? Of course. Um, but some things that I really loved as her, as her mom was, uh, kind of help also supporting her through the interaction is that emphasis on it's good to set a goal. Um, but you don't just automatically get the goal, right? So she was frustrated that she didn't get to be the flyer, um, and really setting the expectation that this takes practice and it takes time um, and kind of reinforcing the things, the steps that she's taking along the way um, that will help her to achieve her goals. Uh, I also just loved the open, the use of open-ended questions. And she even caught herself a few times as she was starting to kind of like, she knew the answers, right? Um, but she caught herself and then used open-ended questions uh, to support Bella in, in responding. I wonder if we should, well, should we go skip this one? Maybe we should skip this one. Um, this is great. I oh, went into the slides. Um, and it's Allison talking about the choices that her parents gave her uh, when she was young. Um, but I know that um, we really want to get to uh, showing some of the IEP examples too. So I'll quickly go talk about this communication connection. Um, I mean, this deserves its whole a whole presentation of its own. So I'm going to just quickly emphasize here that that robust communication system uh, that gives our young children, young adults, uh, all an opportunity to really express themselves. Um, and even when students are at the stage of a very limited vocabulary, um, there are ways that we can use that vocabulary to provide more autonomy and control. Uh, you saw with Emmy, uh, even though she does have access to a communication system, just following her lead in terms of being able to answer a yes and no. Uh, we saw another child 
indicating by holding by choosing something what they want to do right that's that's supporting access to communication at the same time as using choices um, but we can make sure that from the very beginning we're giving children access to powerful what i was called here powerful vocabulary uh, sammy mentioned that choice of having something i have something to say or it's something else uh, is a powerful thing that we can give children to say, right? Because then we know they're initiating something that then we have to figure out. Um, making sure they have a way to say no, stop, and go um, are ways that they can have some control over their environment from a very early stage in their communication development. Um, too often, our really young children or emerging communicators only have access to vocabulary about things. So being able to ask like, do you want crackers or pretzels? <laughs> do you want, you know, um, and, and those are great, but those are what are called fringe vocabulary. They're important in the child's life, but they don't give them a lot of control over their environment. So we want to make sure we have some access to that powerful vocabulary that gives them control from the very beginning. Um, and maybe we just want to go, yeah, let's, okay, this one is super We're fast. Start with show a clip. Let's get our beats going. Good. Morning. Good. I just want to emphasize how this child has control over their communication device. They're holding it. They have easy access to it. Nobody's forcing her to use it. You can probably pause right there. Um, but she has free ability to go back and forth between engaging in that activity and listening to her friends and then using the communication device as a way of participating. So that's because she has lots of ongoing access, right? And she had all the kids' names, it looks like, there on the communication device so that she can, as they're saying names, she can identify a name. It might be one that they're saying now. It might be another child's name. Um, but she has control over how she's participating there. Uh, and then the next one is, uh, oh, it's my favorite. Uh, this is a video that's taken from the Bridge School, which is based in San Francisco and provides support for students with uh, complex communication needs. Um, and uh, I think that the thing I want to just draw attention to in this video is the way in which uh, this child who has limited expressive communication is uh, having so, get, providing some direction and control within this interaction. What would you like to know? Something on here? Okay, let's see. So she followed his lead as he was. What is it? She can ask. Hmm. How does it work? Open ended yes, questions. Can that? What, you how? Oh. That says, what's next? This is when, maybe you can ask when you hear it. What would you like to ask? About the belly. How? How does it work? How? Is it a how question? Yeah. Is it how does it work? Yeah. Oh, how does the fire bell work? Yeah, let's write that down. That's a good question. Okay, so she followed his lead several times through that video. She looked at for his reach, for where his eyes were landing, for any indication that he was giving that she was on the right track. Um, she assumed that he had something to say and that it was her job to figure out what it was that he wanted to say. Um, and then she gave a chance for him to confirm uh, that she got it right. I think for this, um, and I may will make it quick. I think, Amy, just an uh, um, idea that um, it's about supporting children's uh, learning within routines, um, and that's a um, an evidence-based practice about children 
feeling really comfortable within those routines, right? What happens every day, they're predictable experiences. Uh, they help children feel comfortable so that we can focus on then on adding the self-determination, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, self-determination element to those things. And I think that there is a form uh, maybe next, Amy, that, you know, just as, as, a, um, as an idea in terms of uh, self-determination in home routines, choosing a, a home routine could be simple, getting ready for school, taking a bath, getting ready for bed. Uh, what are the current steps um, and activities within that routine? And then identifying at least two areas where additional self-determination elements can be embedded. And it could be about maybe adding choices, maybe checking about, you know, is the communication access clear and available at those uh, at that time. So it could be a variety of things, but we thought that might be really helpful uh, thinking about some um, elements or things that we can do at home uh, that, you know, could get us started. All right. And um, as I mentioned in the chat, this form is available on that toolbox that you all have access to. I have shared it a couple of times in the chat, but if anybody still needs it, just uh, put a little note in the chat and ask us any questions in the chat as well. We're going to move into self-determination within the IEP. I am going to say that we are short on time, so I'm going to kind of give a really brief overview. I'm only going to play one of these videos. Um, and I'm playing this one because it really highlights the importance of checking in with our students about what they want to work on and what their goals are. Um, so I'm just going to play this video and then we'll do a brief discussion of IEPs and goals. Are there any goals that you have set for yourself where you feel like you have um, accomplished something? Learning new, new stuff in school. I hold them well first of all i don't like how you guys are teaching because it seems like you guys are teaching the same stuff that all the kids learn in pre-k and kindergarten and i also told them um and you keep teaching the same stuff over and over again and don't you think that's not right yes you're, you're supposed to teach kids new stuff not the same stuff i was very very successful and i'm so happy i'm in in general education because they teach you real learning stuff other than special ed because special ed only only teaches uh i don't know kindergarten math that's one of them and they and they read special ed stories for history and english now, what even is that for, for that type of subject? That's not basic learning. Yeah. But in general education, they teach is the important stuff that you need to learn in class, like history, real history, a, a. I'm gonna stop it there, but I just wanna highlight that this is a student who has been supported to advocate for themselves and has been listened to in terms of they were frustrated with what they were receiving in terms of instruction. They were supported to express that and then advocate for a different placement. So this student did not want to be placed in a special day class. They wanted to attend general education instruction, and you can hear all of the reasons why they wanted that, um, which that's a that's a whole topic for another day. But it's really important here to highlight that we need to check in with our students on their goals, asking, is this important to you? Yes, no. Do you feel a different way? Um, what is important to you? And providing space to, to give feedback in that sense. Are there um, any goals that and you have set for yourself where you we're going to look at specific self determination goals in a second, but I just want to play this one last video. Amy, is it okay? Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, <laughs> I just want to really highlight the folks that we talked to. Um, and this is a student, a, a, an adult now talking about how they engaged in their IEP process. So in the beginning, I only did for what I was 
ten minutes, and even though it wasn't all constant, it's important for people to remember they're talking about a person. And by fourth grade, I stayed the whole time. Um, we would talk before the IEP about what people were going to say. So we had an idea of that. And we had an idea there was going to be any issues in what areas but by high school I was basically running my IEP and my parents were just there as backup and it's so important to have students at their IEP because they're going to have IPPs with regional centers. They're going to have individual plans for employment with the Department of Rehab. It doesn't really go away when you get older. It's just the institution that changes. So I really wanted to play that one because it, it really highlights why we're including students in their IEP um, for all the reasons that Allison said. We're not going to have time to talk about person-centered planning, but I do want to say that there are resources in your the document we shared. Um, but we want to highlight the importance of including the student in the IEP process before the IEP during the IEP and after the IEP is ended. Um, there are some tips here for how you can do that. I wanna, I, I wanna draw your attention to these uh, so self-determination standards that are available in the toolbox that we shared with you. Um, this is a great way to look at what skills, look at the skills related to self-determination and the things that students might be working on to discuss with your students. Is this something that you want to work on? Does this sound like a skill that is important to you? Um, but what I want to get and what I want to get to, and here's an example of a student sharing their work during um, the pre-IEP, so pr pr preparing a um, a variety of work samples or discussing them in the IEP. So here. Um, is the work sample of this student, Finn, who is uh, Bill Nye at a fair. And um, he's he's asked, oh, what is this? And he says, clever and worn. And the folks at the IEP says, oh, you know, engage in that. Talk about Bill Nye be warning people about the science experiments um, and engaging in discussing this work that he's done. Um, what I want to get to, uh, there are ideas of how to engage a student during an IEP, but I want to show you all here that there are examples of goals that be, can be included in an IEP to support self-determination skill practice throughout the year. Um, so it might be things like um, Michael will use a checklist and AAC to direct others for transitions in and out of his wheelchair. Um, when working on small group projects with peers, Cynthia will suggest topics, solutions, actions towards completing the activities. Um, let's look at, there's more there. Um, here's um, when, when selecting options on high or low tech AAC, Katie will use the something else option, making sure that's always there and honoring that discussion of like, oh, okay, something else, what is it? Um, here, this is if you're working on, on goal setting as part of the IEP, Sammy will identify at least one academic or non-academic goal for herself, identify relevant steps, and monitor her own progress on a weekly basis to adjust goal-related activities accordingly, accordingly throughout the academic year. This is something we can put in the IEP and in the home 
to make sure every week we have time to check in on this goal that's been selected by the students. Maybe it's a cheerleading goal, maybe it's not academic, could be anything that's important to the student, but giving that space and that time to make sure that we're addressing it. Um, and then here's also some ideas for embedding self-determination practice throughout the school year. Um, I wanna just highlight that this, once we select goals, it's so important that students are integrated into the progress monitoring of that goal. And at least, you know, know what the goal is. Your goal for math is this. Here's how you're working towards it. Let's check in on where you are. Today, we're, we're learning about it. Tomorrow, we're going we're gonna to look at what you're doing, and we'll talk about where you are related to your goal. But really making that clear that everybody here at school is working towards goals. Here's where you are at working towards your goal. Here's how you're working on it. Um, and so one thing you can find in the toolbox here is just a planning form for the team, for the family to say, how, how are some, what are some ways that my, your child or your student can participate before, during, and after the IEP in their goal selection, um, writing and progress monitoring. Um, and I just, want to say that, um, again, we made this, this toolbox and we want you guys to be able to use it, but we also want to remind you that in just a few weeks, there are going to be a lot more resources there, including lots of mini webinars um, that you can use um, to, to share with schools, to share with families if you are working at a school. Um, and we just want to thank you all for being here. Uh,